Gracious Lord, you impart yourself, proceeding light from light. Open our ears and our heart by your Spirit. Amen. Amen. In the morning, we get up at whatever time we rise, and we get the day started. In the workings of our minds, our thoughts are coming into order. For some, the first task coming to mind by habit is must make coffee. <laughs> or tea, as it were. But elsewhere in the mind, other things are happening. A larger framework, a sense of self is already booting up and coming into focus. Who are you? What's the sense of your purpose that has been built and adjusted through the years? This framework is, is there for you as you anticipate the actions of your day. And it's kind of a, a hierarchy of thoughts about this. You have these essential tenets, these basic categories of your own personal constitution that have shaped your values and your goals. And these influence what you decide to do in the tasks that you take on day by day. Indeed, we human beings ordinarily take on tasks that fit into the purpose that forms and flows within us. I know this happens, most of it without our even realizing it. But we are meaning-making creatures, and so we fit our own sense of self into greater purposes. We use the word calling or vocation, and these are related words. The word vocation has within it uh, our word voice, uh, and we think of ourselves as having been called by a purpose. Or we are people of faith called by God. We sense that God has called us to a purpose. Small as we are, each of us individually, we receive this wild and wonderful notion that the creator of that huge universe which dwarfs us so, has nonetheless called us into the divine purpose. No matter what we do for a living, no matter what our responsibilities that we attend to, all of that important work comes to be blended in with God's calling to us. We have three passages of Scripture today that have to do with being called by God into the life of God. Isaiah does so. Paul does so in his letter to the Corinthians. And John, who has written the good news, has this opening story of John the Baptist and Jesus and those early disciples, and they're all about calling. Reminding you now of some of that prophecy from Isaiah, the Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand. He hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And so with that last line just quoted, we see the identity of the one talking, Israel. Isaiah the prophet has received from God this way of telling the story that this people of Israel was called before they were even born to a particular purpose. And why would that be such an important message for Isaiah to take up? 
because this is a people who's lost their way uh, to a large extent. Generations of their people have been separated and quite aimless in many ways. They're in exile. Many of their people were left behind in Jerusalem. And some of the super key folk, the talented folk, were taken off to a foreign land. And it had been that way for several generations. And so God means for them to rebuild their hope, to sense again their purpose and their calling. Now what we find as Christians is that God was readying the world for a, a whole new call through Jesus Christ to have that aspect of Israel moving out into the world. Even when Isaiah uttered these words, the calling was bigger than people usually thought. The calling was to bring all nations into the life of God. Uh, you might have noticed uh, in that Isaiah passage that Israel's calling is tied up in these words, I will give you as a light to the nations. So it's not one specific geography that's connecting to God through the servant Israel. It's all people. It's all nations. Well, Paul certainly got the sense that God had done something new and bigger than anything before in the person of Jesus Christ. When he writes this letter to the Corinthians, he starts with very positive words. And it's interesting because the rest of the letter has some difficult pieces. Paul is troubleshooting in this brand new church. Uh, they have been fighting. They have uh, wondered which way to go. Paul is giving them the coaching that they need, and it's not an easy letter. But he does have these affirmations for them, and he certainly starts the letter with these positive things. First of all, he points to himself as called. Notice he says, he says, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. He's called to be an apostle, a word that means sent out. And though all the apostles were sent out, Paul is this specialized apostle that's going further, that's going to the Gentiles. And he takes some others with him, Barnabas and Mark and uh, eventually Luke and Titus and Timothy, and he mentions here Sosthenes. But these are the ones who, through Paul's tenacity, are sent out from where they would normally just sit and settle into these places where he gives the word that they too are connected to God, that the Lord Jesus Christ seeks a relationship with them. Indeed, he is called as an apostle. And what does he say? He says, you, Corinthian Christians, you are called to be saints, that is, people set apart. God has made you different than you even thought. You are set apart to the purposes of God. And at the very end of the passage, we read also that God is faithful. Paul writes, by God, you were called into fellowship, the fellowship of his son. So this notion of calling is amazing. It, it is amazing. Uh, I mean, we're just going about living our lives, and yet we're connected to the one who created all. That is amazing. John is a wonderful gospel, and here in the very first part of it, John the Baptist is 
fin forming and finishing his own ministry. It looks like this new Israel, this recreating of God's purposes in the earth, begins with a movement of baptism. And John the Baptist is uh, catching the attention of a wide region. He's stationed by the waters of the Jordan, but people are coming to him from pretty far away places to hear about repentance and the need to uh, set a path that is straight, that is ready for the Lord. And the most important part of the path for all of these people that have come is the path of the Lord straight into their hearts. But Paul, uh, but John, the baptizer, gets to the point in his ministry, even though it looks like the phenomenon with crowds coming, where he starts to point to another. And those disciples of John that have paid the most attention to him, he tells them there's another. And this other is the one who baptizes in the Spirit. And so the ones close to John are prepped for a change. And when Jesus comes around, John points to him and says, Look, it's the Lamb of God. And two of his disciples, that is two of John the Baptist's disciples, go over to talk to Jesus. And when they do, Jesus says, what do you want? And they say, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he says, come and see. Well, something of this calling nature uh, is recapitulated in one of those disciples. His name is Andrew. He's the brother of Simon. And the, these two fishermen are sons of Jonah, or sons of John, another John. And he goes to his brother Simon, and he says, you've got to come. We have found the Messiah. Already Andrew knows, and he knows it's not just for him, and he wants to bring his brother along. Already something of the light of light has illumined Andrew, and he wants to share and bring another. When Simon comes to Jesus, Jesus says, I know you. You are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas, or our name Peter. So this is the beginning of how God came into the world through the Son, but it's not just stopping, it's going out. It's beginning to move, and it's moving through people who have this epiphany, uh, the sense that in Christ something is taking place. And that is why this theme of calling, the calling of the disciples, the calling of us all, is a theme that always hits in the Epiphany season, the Sundays after the Epiphany. Because when we feel called, it is only because we have seen something, and what we have seen affects us, and moves us, and changes us, and we begin to fold our purposes into God's purpose. So we've talked about the calling of Israel. We've talked about Paul's calling and his word that the Corinthian Christians have been called. And we see how the disciples of John the Baptist are moved to be disciples of Jesus. But what we're most interested in is the calling that God has made to each of us. This is the epiphany we're interested in. No matter where we are or what we're up to right now, 
We may be working. We may be between jobs. We may have found other things to gather our efforts. With the career behind us, we are seeing each day as an opportunity to apply ourselves, and it is ministry that is taking place. From time to time, you will find yourself moved with a special kind of love to reach out to somebody, with a heart of compassion to address somebody. And I don't think that's accidental. I think that's because of the vocation that you have. I think that's because you are connected to the God of love who moves you into this kind of ministry. We always come to the end of our gathering time after we have received this special meal of Christ's body and blood and we take a moment to give thanks, to register that we see this time as a time of, of spiritual nourishment. And then these are the words that we pray in the, in the prayer after communion. They're easy to gloss over, which is what I mostly do, but sometimes I notice them. And this is our prayer. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. That, in fact, is what we do. Christ's word continues to go. Christ's light continues to shine. And it shines through you because you have heard his calling. Amen.